Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, Lord God, to worship under the banner of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would bless this hour together and when we study the life of your servants of old. I pray that you would be with us as we listen to the sermon or as we have heard the sermon. Lord God, that it would sink deep into our hearts and we would reflect on the Lord's Supper this day which we remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whose body was broken for us and blood was shed for the redemption of our souls. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> all right, so let's get started. we got a lot to cover today. First question. Were all 16th century reformers disciples of Martin Luther? No. Did you have to get the Martin Luther decoder ring to be a reformer? Well, if you're Martin Luther, you uh, or so he thought. No, no, obviously not, right? So what's the other big branch of the Reformation? So there's Lutheran and Reformed. Yes, Reformed. Although as we're going to talk about today, Reformed is actually bigger than just Calvin. Uh, the guy that really starts off the Reformed movement at almost the exact same time as Luther is starting his movement in Germany is a guy named Ulrich Zwingli. Uh, he's actually born only seven weeks after Martin Luther. He's born not far away in neighboring Switzerland in Wildhaus to a farmer and local magistrate. Uh, he graduated from the University of Basel with a bachelor's in 1504. That's very close to Luther's dates. And Luther was BA 1502, MA 1505. So you can see is, his life is almost mirroring Luther's in that way. Uh, but unlike Luther... Unlike Luther, Zwingli was much more influenced positively by humanism and by Erasmus. If you remember, we talked last week, Martin Luther, in the beginning, he's kind of fine with Erasmus, but then he really, really goes off, goes off on him uh, in one of his most famous books called The Bondage of the Will. Uh, Zwingli, much more of a humanist than Martin Luther is. He became a priest at the Great Minster Church in Zurich in 1518. And unlike uh, the way they did it in the day, the way they do it now, he didn't preach from whatever the lectionary was. He didn't preach from whatever the church told him to preach. He started in the Gospel of Matthew and he preached it verse by verse, which was revolutionary right at the time. People had not heard this kind of preaching before, and so people are going to the great minister to try to, try to listen to this man, Zwingli. And he converted the whole canton of Zurich in short order to Protestantism. Unlike Martin Luther... So, like Martin Luther, he uses the force of persuasion. But Zwingli also, uh, he holds, like, town debates. So, Zurich says, hey, we're going to decide between what you're teaching and what the Catholic Church is teaching. Let's have a debate about it. And Zwingli would get up there, and he would present his issues, and they would say, hey, Zwingli, you, you've proved your point. So, now Zurich is going to be Protestant. What language is he preaching? He's preaching in German, Swiss German. Swiss German. Um, most of Switzerland at this time, if you don't know too much about Switzerland... Uh, it's, even today, it's not really, I mean, it's a unified country, but not really. It's, it's made up of several sovereign states, city-states, and uh, at this time, forest territories as well. So Zurich is one of the four big city-states, or cantons, uh, in what we would now call Switzerland. Uh, most of them speak German, although on the western side of Switzerland, when we get to Calvin, they actually speak French in the cantons that border France. Uh, so that's why today, even in Switzerland, they actually have three official languages, French, uh, French, German, and Italian, because all different regions of Switzerland speak English, but predominantly German. It's also important to note that Zwingli said, hey, I wasn't copying Luther. Zwingli is saying that he almost at the same time is coming to this conclusions as he's preaching through the Bible and he's reading the Bible. This isn't to say that he didn't know about Luther, that he didn't read some of Luther, but he wasn't he's not one of these guys that starts off as a Luther disciple and then breaks away. He's never a Luther disciple. Uh, and he dies at the Battle of Capel in October 1531. Something you need to know about the Swiss is they love mercenary armies. Right? We all know what a mercenary is. Someone that gets paid to go fight. Uh, it's not even their battle to fight. The Swiss were, were known for being very good soldiers, and they would basically sell themselves out to whoever needed them, which Zwingli wasn't a big fan of. Uh, unfortunately, his canton came under attack, 1531. He went out with, with the soldiers. Uh, he got injured. 
he kind of hung out under an oak tree until some Catholic soldiers came by and uh, tortured him to death uh, for not recanting his Protestant beliefs. So what's some of his thought? He was a very, very regal looking fellow, as you can tell. So Lord's Supper, this is the thing that divides the Reformation from the very start, is the Lord's Supper, which I think it's so fitting because I didn't plan this. We're celebrating the Lord's Supper today. It's, the Lord is behind, obviously, all of this scheduling and timing because I haven't planned any of it. Uh, if you saw me at midnight last night, you would know that I haven't planned any of it. <laughs> so the Lord's Supper divides, divides the Reformation from the beginning. And Zwingli has what we call the memorialist view of the Lord's Supper. So when Christ says, this is my body, Luther says, Jesus is telling the absolute, literal truth. That bread becomes his body in some way. Not in a transubstantiation way, but, but Christ's flesh is actually there in some way. Vigley says, no, 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 no. When Jesus says, this is my body, what he really is saying is, this represents my body. Like I showed you before, right? A picture of my kids. These are my kids. Well, they're obviously not my kids, right? The, the picture represents my kids. So Zwingli has a very, what we would call today, memorialist view. They bitterly divide. Luther and Zwingli bitterly divide over this, and their followers divide. And so a German prince named Philip of Hesse says, hey, the Catholics are really coming after us. We really need to band together. So let's, let's get a, the theological dream team together, and we will sit down and we will hammer through these issues. And that's what they did. It was called the Marburg Colloquy in 1529, and it was a theological dream team. So Zwingli's there, Luther's there, uh, I think Bootser's there, uh, a bunch of Reformed guys that you wouldn't know now, but at the time they were, you know, the John MacArthur's and the John Piper types uh, of their day, the J.I. Packers and Al Mohler's, right? They're all there, and they agree on 14 and a half out of 15 points, and, the, and that, one, that one half point is on the Lord's Supper. Zwingli thought that Luther's view was close to Eutychianism. Remember, we studied that a long time ago. And I know you've slept since then, but what is Eutychianism? Anyone? One of our Trinitarian heresies from um, back in the day. Actually, it's a Christological heresy. That's right. So Eutychianism was the idea that Christ's divinity absorbed his humanity, right? It's as if Eutyches said that Christ's human nature was like a drop of wine dropped in the ocean, right? The ocean just consumes it. That's what Eutychianism is. And Zwingli thought that Luther's view was very close to Eutychianism because it's, it's the, the divine is absorbing the flesh and basically saying that the flesh of Christ can be omnipresent everywhere, just like his deity. Which was, so for Zwingli, this is a very Christological problem, what Luther is trying to do. Luther is, is conflating the natures, if you will, of Jesus Christ. Well, Luther thought that Zwingli was a Nestorian. Okay, what did the Nestorians believe? We talked about this ad nauseum a few months back. I appreciate your honesty. <laughs> so Nestorius, remember, Nestorius taught that there's a radical separation in the natures of Christ. He, he basically has two natures, right, and two, two uh, persons, okay? So it's basically there's, there's divine, human, uh, different persons, right? Two persons, two natures. And Luther thought that's what Zwingli's doing. Because what Zwingli is saying is that in the Lord's Supper, even though God is there as, uh, he's, even though Christ is there as a deity, as deity, he's not there in his humanity. So you're saying that Christ is separated. That's Luther's problem. Luther had such a problem with it that he did not think that Zwingli or any of the Reformed were Christian. If Martin Luther came in this church right now, he would not think that anyone in this church was a Christian. Specific, it doesn't matter about justification by faith. It doesn't matter about everything else that you agree with Luther on. For Luther, this is the whole deal. right? It's a denial of the incarnation if you say that the flesh is not there. And Zwingli also taught that... So, so Christ, and the later reform, the later reform would really teach us, is that Christ is there uh, in his deity, but he only nourishes those that eat him by faith. 
Right? So if you were an unbeliever and I gave you the Lord's Supper, you're not, you're not in any way participating in anything with Christ. Luther has a much more Catholic view of it. So it actually, the Lord's Supper confers grace. So even those that aren't believers are receiving something by it. Which again, they, they fell out bitterly over. Zwingli, uh, Luther famously said that he would rather drink blood with the Papists than wine with the Zwinglians. That was one of his tamer comments about Zwingli. Uh, Zwingli also was much more different than Luther on church worship. Luther, if you've, if you've been to a, a kind of a traditional Lutheran service before, uh, or if you've studied Lutheranism, it's, it's got a very Catholic feel to it. Not Catholicism, but a Catholic feel. Luther was a big proponent of keeping everything from stained glass, he had no problem with candles, he had no problem with singing hymns, musical instruments. For Luther, that was all what we would call adiaphora, which means things indifferent. And Luther wasn't really concerned about adiaphora. Um, he, saw, he could care really either way. Zwingli was opposite. Zwingli actually starts expounding what we would today call the regulative principle, that you can only do things in worship that God specifically permits by Scripture. If you introduce anything in the, into worship at all that's, that's not explicitly given permission by Scripture, you're introducing idolatry in some way. Right? So Zwingli gets rid of candles, altars, priestly garments, a much more what we would be familiar with as far as you know what a church looks like when you walk in. You walk in and it's a plain room. That's, for the most part, what Zwingli taught. No uh, he did not allow. He loved music. People think because he didn't like music and worship, he hated music. He was actually a very gifted musician. He just didn't believe that music that, and musical instruments were supposed to be in service. So they would actually recite... Um, different things antiphonically, which means that, uh, so like when we sing, uh, it is well with my soul, right, and then someone else comes in right after it is well with my soul, and we're saying it at two different times, they would do that, but that was the limit they would do. Calvin would come back later, in the later Reformed, and Calvin wouldn't be a fan of instruments in service, but they would sing, and they would sing primarily the Psalms. Uh, and even in many conservative Presbyterian denom denominations today, they subscribe to what we would call exclusive psalmody, which means they only sing the songs. Do they sing the songs about using instruments? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we clearly, we clearly are not an exclusive psalmist. Uh, I, to be honest with you, I don't know if I've ever seen. Maybe, maybe the strictest of Reformed Baptists maybe are exclusive psalmody, but Baptists have a rich, rich tradition of hymns and hymnody. Um, so we would obviously disagree with. Uh, and Calvin actually was not an exclusive psalmist. People think he was. He said, hey, what's better than singing God's own songs back to him? Which is a very clever argument. Because um, then, you, then you can know that what you're singing is right. Uh, but he didn't, he wasn't opposed to other things being sung in worship. Uh, other, other reformed branches, and especially, again, in conservative Presbyterianism, it's exclusive psalmody or, or bust. Zwingli, though, never occupies, and Calvin doesn't either, and I want to get this across, none of them occupy the place in the Reformed movement that Luther did in Lutheranism. Okay, Luther was larger than life, and everything in Lutheranism subsisted under him. And even when he died, the arguments became, the conflict in the Lutheran church became, we are the true adherents of Luther. In, Reformed, in the Reformed world, it didn't happen. There are really... Uh, in our need, and I think he's right, says there are really five principal guys. Zwingli starts it. Zwingli's not the most influential either. There are five guys, and we're going to talk about all five, one of which is Calvin, who to us is a huge name today, right? In fact, we call basically reforms to many of us equals Calvinism, uh, which is hilarious in many ways. Calvin actually wasn't even the most popular for most of his life when he was alive. Uh, in fact, Heinrich Bullinger, if you were in England in the, in the 16th century, uh, hands down you probably read Bullinger more than you read Calvin. Uh, he was a Swiss reformer that was converted by reading Luther and Melanchthon at the University of Cologne. What is one thing we're noticing about all these reformers? University. They're all university educated. All right? and, and really, they're all humanistly educated, with the exception of really Luther. I mean, Luther gets some humanism in there, but... Luther's still very much coming from a medieval context. Most of the, all, almost all of the Reformed guys are coming from this new vibrant humanism. 
uh, and most of them, which is why most of them like Erasmus as opposed to Luther. Uh, he joined a monastery in 1523, and he converted all of the monks in the monastery to Protestantism within four years, which is a power move. Power move. <laughs> Uh, when Zwingli died in 1531, he took Zwingli's place as the leader of the Reformed movement and church in Zurich. And like I said, he was very influential throughout Europe. Everyone corresponded with him who was in the Reformed movement, but he was especially popular in England. His, they basically took a bunch of his sermons and made a systematic theology textbook out of it called Bullinger's Decades. And that was actually kind of the standard systematic theology textbook used in England. Uh, in the 16th century. So very popular. Why, why Bollinger? <sighs> why not? Uh, so he was, so first off, very educated guy. His, uh, his exposition was generally very good. His uh, Bible commentaries and such. Uh, I mean, they all produced Bible commentaries. To us, if you would read them, if you read a Reformation commentary, you know, it's hard to go find Bollinger on the shelf anywhere these days. Uh, Reformation Heritage Books do, did actually just recently republish his decades, uh, but his commentaries you're not going to find. One of the unique things about Calvin, as opposed to all of the other reformers, are people are still reading and using his commentaries because uh, they're still easy to read and still very biblically sound. Bollinger and Boots are these guys, if you read them, that you'd probably think, like, what's going on here? But at the time, they were very popular. So Bollinger is one of these, along with Bootser and Calvin, he's one of those Bailey guys pretty quick, um, and uh, Vermeule, they're really kind of the, again, the only way I can describe it is kind of like the, the Al Mohler, John MacArthur types in the church at that time. Right? So why is John MacArthur so popular among many people? I would argue that he's pretty popular because people think he teaches the Bible really well. I would say no different in the 16th century. Uh, another guy was a guy named Martin Bootser. Also a regal looking fellow. Love the side profile. Uh, he led the Reformation movement in Strasbourg, which is now in France, but was in Germany back in the day. Uh, he was a Dominican monk that was converted to Protestantism after hearing Luther in person. He actually went to the Heidelberg Disputation in 1518 and was sitting in the crowd and heard Luther debating with other people. And he said, man, that's, i got to get me some of that. <laughs> um, which is, you know, so it's one of those things. Do debates convince people? Do they convince the people you're debating with? Most often, no. They do convince people in the crowd, though. And that's, the, that's the utility of a debate. It's not converting your enemy. It's the people sitting in the crowd. Uh, so Martin Boots are personally influenced by Martin Luther. Uh, later on in his life, so he goes to Strasbourg, he leads the Reformation there. In 1549, he's forced to leave, and he goes to England, where he teaches at Cambridge until he dies in 1551. Uh, he was very influential on later Reformed doctrine, Calvin especially. Some of the teachings that really get associated with Calvin, especially like on the Lord's Supper, are really actually just stuff that he got from Bootser. Uh, he believed that the church should not be governed by the state. So how is that different than Lutheranism? So in Martin Luther's Reformation, who controls the church? Well, pretty much the local government and the church government are pretty well intertwined. Yeah, but that's it. That's everywhere, though, right? So if you if you're in a Lutheran church, so you would call it the Magisterial Reformation, even with the Reform, right? They're doing it with the help of the civic leaders. Martin Luther's Reformation is still very much a, the state is really calling the shots with ministers, with all kinds of other things, and even in in Zurich with Zwingli, the city council is really calling the shots. One of the things we're going to see the reform movement, starting with Bootser, but really with Calvin, is, hey, we should have a Christian state, but the state should not control the church. Right? The church should be a separate entity governing itself. Which is something that Calvin's going to struggle with his whole life in Geneva. Because the powers that be did not agree with that. But that's different than how even the beginning of the reform movement starts, because in Zurich, 
This is basically, he basically goes to the town council and he says, hey, I'm gonna, this is what I believe. We're going to follow what you, what you set down. And for Zwingli, it all turns out well for him. Uh, his doctrine of the Lord's Supper is also different than Zwingli. It's a middle way between Luther uh, and Zwingli. So again, Luther thinks that Jesus Christ is actually, we call it consubstantial. He, Christ is above, below, around the bread. Christ in the flesh is physically present in some way. He just thought it was ridiculous to say that the bread became uh, the flesh. He thought it was a philosophical delusion. And then Zwingli is the complete opposite. Com he just says, this is a memorial. This represents my body. So it causes us to remember something that happened in the past and to be thankful for it. Bootser, <coughs> wow, that was really high. Bootser and Calvin after him develop what becomes the, the classical formulation of the Reformed view of the Lord's Supper, which is that when you take the Lord's Supper in faith, you do spiritually feed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? But he, his flesh is not physically present. Why? Because his flesh is in heaven. Right? Because he's got a human nature and a divine nature. Uh, and so only in his divine nature, communicated to you by the Holy Spirit, uh, through faith in the Lord's Supper, you are actually eating, uh, in a very spiritual way, you are eating Christ. So it's kind of, as you can see, right, it's kind of a middle ground between where Zwingli says, okay, well, well, God is there because God is deity, but you're not, you're not eating him you're, in any way. You're remembering, you're recalling what Christ did for you. And on the other hand, you've got Luther that says, no, 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 this is my body. At the Marburg Colloquy, Luther writes on the table from the beginning of the, the conference, this is my body, and he would not budge. Because he's Luther. <clears throat> and then finally, before we get to Calvin, there was a guy named Peter Martyr Vermeule, who I actually think has a really sweet beard. Uh, he was an Italian born, so these other guys we were talking about, uh, a lot of them were uh, German. Uh, Vermeule is actually Italian, he's an Augustinian monk, just like Luther. <clears throat> he was influenced by the writings of Zwingli. And also, we have to remember, there were a lot of Catholics that wanted to reform the church as well, that didn't want to go so far as to break away. Uh, two of those guys were Juan de Valdez and a very famous cardinal named Cardinal Contarini, uh, who Vermeule was very friendly with before he broke away from the church. Uh, he was forced to flee Italy in 1542 because he had staunch Protestant convictions by that time. So where did he go? He went to England. And Stras well, Strasbourg and then England. He went and taught at Oxford uh, until the Catholic Queen Mary ascended the throne. We will talk about the English Reformation next week. Super fascinating. If you love ex wives. And he wrote long lasting Bible commentaries and was influential with Bootser and Calvin in the formulation of the Lord's Supper we talked about. Uh, I, <clears throat> I want to say I read somewhere that his Bible commentaries, people read them for close to 200 years. So they were pretty long-lasting commentary. I mean, if you think about it, how many books uh, do you read from over 200 years ago except the Bible? Right? Uh, unless I've given it to you. Uh, or you're reading the Puritans, my boys. Right? Most people, most people, first off, aren't reading at all. Uh, and if they are reading, they're reading the la latest thing on the bestsellers list, something easy to digest. I do not go to many houses and see people reading books from 200 years ago, let alone Bible commentaries from 200 years ago. But such was the force of his, his mind and his clarity of, of thought that people used it for a long time. And like I said, Calvin is very unique in this way. You can still buy all of Calvin's commentaries and not just so people it looks cool on the shelf. You actually pull them out and use them, and they're actually very, very, very good. Um, which, again, he wrote 500 years ago, which is crazy. <clears throat> All right, so this is a loaded question. But who is historically proved to be the most influential reform performer? Joseph Arminius. <laughs> Why are you joking? <laughs> it's probably not far off. Uh, most Joel insidious man. Yeah. No, he, he doesn't fall into that category. Arminius, actually, so we'll, we'll probably talk about Arminius two weeks from now. But Arminius does come from the reform tradition, right? So. Many, many a modern Arminian scholar would say that, you know, count as far Arminian, you can hate it, but it's a reformed debate. We can argue that. But. So John Calvin, <clears throat> 1509 to 1564. What's one thing you notice already about his birthday? 
him with everybody else? Yeah. He's younger. He's younger, right? He's the next generation after Luther, right? So Luther's born 1484, right? So Luther is over 20 years older than Calvin by the time Calvin was born. Uh, and most of the guys, right? So uh, Bootser is 10 years older than him. Bullinger is, uh, Bullinger is way older than that, I think. I don't know, actually, Bullinger is 7 I was thinking of, uh, uh, he's born in Noyon, France, to a local church official in July 1509. <clears throat> Earned his Master of Arts in 1528 and a law degree in 1532. What's really interesting is that his father, Gerard, was kind of a notary for the, for the local cathedral. And so he wanted John to go be a priest. He wanted him to have a career in the church because it was very lucrative and very prestigious and all that kind of jazz. And when he's in school, when he's in college, his dad has some kind of falling out with the cathedral chapter. And he said, well, you know what, John? Uh, you're going to be a lawyer now. And so Calvin, being a dutiful son, says, okay, I'm going to be a lawyer. Which is completely different than who? Than Luther. What's Luther's story? Um, Father wants him to be a lawyer. Yeah. And then he says, no, I'm going to become a monk slash priest. And his dad said, hey, don't do that. And Luther does it anyway. Mm -hmm. So... Calvin, in Calvin we see, now Luther again, later in life, you know, regretted disobeying his father. At the same time, Luther has an aggressive streak that Calvin does not have. So Calvin, Calvin is very, very staunch in his beliefs, but he's much more of a shy, reserved guy. Uh, you know, if Calvin and Luther were in this church, you know, Luther would probably be the guy I'd want to hang out with. Not, Calvin would be like, you know, the friend in the back that never talks kind of deal. Um, he was always very awkward around other people. Well, not always awkward, but some people found him aloof. aloof. Uh, in fact, Needham in the book says that at one point, uh, a French refugee addressed him as Brother John, and, and he said, it's Monsieur Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's pretentious. Uh, he probably converted to Protestant convictions uh, in his early 20s, and he fled France in 1535 as a result. Things were heating up for Protestants there. Uh, in 1536, so he's not even 30 years old yet, he publishes his first edition of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. All right, it was way shorter than this the first time. Right, this is, he, he republishes it four times, it gets bigger every time. This is the 1559 uh, translated from the Latin edition. This is so, so widely read still that you can buy this at Barnes & Noble. Right? You don't even have to go to Amazon. They still sell it at Barnes & Noble. That many people are still reading it. Um, I think you should read it. It is, it's the, if you want to study theology, it's way easier to understand than almost anyone you can go buy off the shelf. You compare this to, say, John Frame, forget about it. John, John Frame, what are you talking about? Right? Calvin, clear to the point, uh, brutal at times, and very, very, very biblical. The, the, the Bible quotations. And you're just thinking, like, he did all this without the internet. <laughs> I couldn't even do this with the internet. Highly recommend, highly recommend that in addition to the confessions, which we've talked about before, highly recommend that you make it one time in your life through the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Uh, and I'll share some quotes with you in a minute. Uh, just that I pulled from my own notes as I was re uh, reviewing what I read. <clears throat> Calvin, so Calvin says, okay, I gotta get out of France. I'm a pretty smart dude. Uh, the Institutes make him very well known throughout Europe. It's kind of an instant success. Uh, Luther even uh, speaks positively of it. <clears throat> so he says, you know what? I'm just going to go to Strasbourg and I'm going to live a, basically a comfortable life as a theologian. Uh, so on his way to Strasbourg, though, there's a war going on uh, that kind of blocks the road. And so he has to take a detour. And so he spends the night in July 1536 in a town on the western part of Switzerland called Geneva. And there was a famous French reformer there named William Farrell. Geneva had just come over to Protestantism, like within the last year or two. And so Farrell, who was already very popular in France as a reformer, was trying to get the Reformation off the ground in Geneva. And he heard that the author of the Institutes, this, this newly published, critically acclaimed Christian book, was in Geneva. And so he said to Calvin, hey, stay and help me. And Calvin said, nah, I'm going to go hang out in Strasbourg and live a cozy life. And Pharaoh called down basically the curse of God on him. Uh, 
He said, I pray that God would curse your time in Strasbourg. And Calvin, Calvin took that very, he was a very conscientious fellow, he took that very seriously. He said, you know what, I'll stay. <laughs> and I'll help guide the Reformation. Again, Farrell, a generation older than Calvin. Uh, he's only there a short while before him and Farrell get booted. Uh, they argued with the town council over communion. And so they said, uh, well, it was nice having you, but don't come back. So he's like, great, I go to Strasbourg now. I go hang out. And that's what he did for two years. He pastored a French refugee church there. He married a woman named uh, Inlet, I think is how you say it. Uh, she was the wife of an Anabaptist who had died. Uh, he called it the happiest times of his life. But he was invited back to Geneva in 1541. So the Catholic Church recognized there was a lot of stuff going on in Geneva. And so they got one of their cardinals, a guy named Sadaletto, who was a, he was one of these really reform-minded Catholics who really wanted a... He's much more influenced by Augustine than by you know, the Pope's. And so they say, hey, Sadaletto, maybe you can convince Geneva to come back. And so he writes basically an open letter to the town. And they send it to, to Calvin, and a bunch of friends basically pressure Calvin to respond. And he responds with one of the greatest small little treatises of the entire Reformation. And that's actually your big reading for today. Uh, it's not super long. It's a little over 30 pages. Uh, it is a great testimony of the faith that we all uphold and believe. So they're so impressed with this. 1541, they invite him back. Now remember, they didn't just ask him to leave. They banished him from Geneva in 1538. So what do you think is the first thing he does when he comes back in 1541? When he gets up into the pulpit, what does he do? Talks about communion? No. He picks he, up wherever he left off. He picks up wherever he left off. The very next verse that he was going to preach from two years before, that's where he starts. Uh, radically oriented towards preaching the Bible. Um, he has a lot of troubles with the town council. Uh, they kind of get over it in the late 1540s, early 1550s. Uh, he kind of gets rid of his opponents. They, they're banished from the town. And then he kind of is left to reform the church for the most part how he wants. That being said, he's never a, he never holds any position higher than pastor. So it's just through the sheer force of influence that he gets stuff done. One thing that made him really famous at the time, and everyone was super happy, that today he gets a lot of flack for, is the prosecution of a guy named Michael Servetus. Michael Servetus was one of the smartest guys in Europe at the time, very, very smart guy, said horrible things about the Trinity. Uh, and so everyone hated him, Catholics and Protestants. In fact, I think it was in Vienna, he was condemned to be burned at the stake. He managed to escape, and for some reason thought Geneva would be a cool place to hang out. They arrested him. Calvin tried to persuade him to believe in the Trinity. He refused. The state, doing what the state did back then, tried him for heresy. Calvin prosecuted, and then they burned him at the stake. Now Calvin, Calvin said, well, burning at the stake is a really horrible way to die. Why don't we just cut off his head? But at the end of the day, Calvin was involved in this heresy trial. And he gets so much flack for it today, uh, which, again, you know, we shouldn't go around burning people, uh, regardless of their heresies. That being said... Everyone in Europe applauded him, the Catholics and the Protestants. Right? This, got, this got him so much street cred, if you will, at the time. Because every state in Europe, Protestant or Catholic, right, would persecute a notorious heretic for denying the Trinity. Right? That, you couldn't get away with that in any country in Europe at the time. Uh, Calvin just happened to be the guy uh, in the right place at the right time, if you will, to seal the deal. Uh, but... It is kind of his one big blot on his record, if you will. You know, with, with Luther, we have the whole bigamy problem. Well, Luther wrote some pretty horrible things about the Jews. Uh, Luther said, hey, slaughter all the peasants that are not right. Luther, Luther had a lot of great stuff going for him and a lot of really bad stuff going for him at the same time. Calvin, Calvin has the surveillance thing. Uh, in 1559, he founded the Geneva Academy, which still exists, which is still a college. Uh, people like to think that Calvinism, because of its belief in predestination, doesn't believe in missionary work, which is the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard, because as we'll find out in a few weeks, the modern mission movement in Protestantism was actually done by Calvinists. Um, Geneva 
in seven years, towards the end of Calvin's life, produced 118 missionaries, many of which were martyred uh, back in their homelands, especially France, burned at the stake. Carter, historian Carter Lindbergh says that Geneva was a kind of Protestant Vatican, in that people would just flock, Protestants from all over Europe would flock to Geneva to see what it was like, to learn from Calvin, and then he would train them and send them out into the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for many of them, right, especially back in their homeland of France, uh, they died for it. So his thought. What's Calvin most known for? Predestination. Predestination. What have we learned so far in church history? This is not a, he didn't start it. He, did not, he didn't start it. He didn't refound it. Right? We saw it in Gottschalk. We saw it in Aquinas. We saw it in Bradford died. We saw it in Remini. We saw it in Luther. All of the reformers... Bootser, Bullinger, Zwingli, Vermeili, all of them believe this, right? It's not Calvinism, it's Augustinianism. It's, it's what the Bible teaches. But for some reason, he gets the credit for it as if he invented the doctrine. Uh, it wasn't even the most important doctrine to him. You want to know why? Because everyone that he knew believed it, right? So do you know why he, he specifically is associated with this? Yes, well, people do, so I don't know the ins and outs. What I would say is that over time, Luther becomes much more read than others. And then nothing defines your position more than being in an argument with someone else. So you have Arminius come along uh, about 30-ish, 40 years after Calvin dies, and Arminius is actually taught by Calvin's successor, a guy named Theodore Beza. And so really, Calvinism really defines itself like the whole doctrines of grace, you know, TULIP. TULIP doesn't exist in written form until you actually have the Arminians opposing the doctrines. And then, so it's kind of like when we talk about the Christological debates, no, or the Trinity. No one defines the Trinity until they need to define the Trinity because people are arguing against it. So I would say really the argument with Arminius, who's coming out of the Calvin, specifically the Genevan tradition, uh, really is one of the big reasons why uh, Calvin gets ascribed that doctrine. Even though, again, you read Spurgeon. Spurgeon says, look, I'll call myself a Calvinist, but it's not Calvinism. It's, it's the Bible. Um, you have a about that. Uh, he instituted the, the version that we're familiar with of Presbyterian church government in Geneva. So he's really, Knox, John Knox gets the credit for being the founder of Presbyterianism. It's really Calvin. Calvin says, look, in the church there are four offices. There are doctors who basically teach like in this kind of setting, there are lecturers, there are pastors who do what Pastor John does, there are deacons who serve, and there are elders that kind of help enforce discipline. Uh, that Genevan model, John Knox is going to come in and he's going to bring back to Scotland, right? And the church in Scotland is going to become a Presbyterian church. And when we look at the English Civil War, in the English Civil War, that was a big thing. The Puritans, most of the Purit Puritans were Presbyterians, and they wanted to institute Presbyterian church government in England, right? So they didn't believe in bishops or anything like this. They believed in this kind of church government. He also co-authored with Bullinger in 1549 the Consensus Tigurinus that solidified the position we already talked about on the Lord's Supper, right? The spiritual feeding. He influenced reformers throughout Europe through his biblical teaching, especially... John Knox, and the, uh, who is Scottish, right? And then also the English. A lot of English flee to Geneva. A lot of English pastors and theologians. When Mary becomes Queen of England and starts persecuting Protestants again, over 800 Protestant ministers and theologians flee England. A lot of them go to Geneva. And Geneva wows the... Wows, uh, Knox said it was the most perfect school of Christ that ever existed on the planet since the days of the Apostles. Uh, in fact, if you read Needham, Needham actually describes a Lutheran, so remember the Lutheran and the Reform don't get along, a Lutheran that visited Geneva 50 years after Calvin dies and was still so impressed with how godly a town it was because of the way they had structured everything. Hmm. So Calvin, very influential there. And like we already talked about several times, his biblical commentaries are still regarded today uh, you can also buy a lot of his sermons, right? So you can actually compare his sermon and his commentary and then find whatever text when he talks about it in the Institutes 
and you can have a very, very thorough knowledge of what Calvin taught on that topic. So some quotes from Calvin. These are all from the Institutes. This is on the providence of God. He said, those who have a tolerable acquaintance with the scriptures see that, with a view to brevity, I am only producing a few out of many passages, from which it is perfectly clear that it is the merest trifling to substitute a bare permission for the providence of God. As if he sat in a watchtower waiting for fortuitous events, his judgments, meanwhile, depending on the will of man. Calvin's saying, look, God is... God doesn't just create and then sit there waiting for you to do what you want in order for him to accomplish his purpose. Everything, everything falls under the providence of God. Everything that happens, whether you understand it or not, is in some way part of the decree of God. And God waits on no man to accomplish what he's doing, right? Including your salvation. Uh, John Calvin on faith. This is one of my favorites. He says, we shall now have a full definition of faith if we say that it is a firm and sure knowledge of the divine favor toward us, founded on the truth of a free promise in Christ, and revealed to our minds and sealed our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's faith. Faith is firm and sure knowledge of divine favor. So assurance is a part of faith, right? Founded on the truth of a free promise in Christ. Beautiful. And then John Calvin on the importance of doctrine. He says, doctrine is not an affair of the tongue, but of the life. It is not apprehended by the intellect and memory merely, like other branches of learning, but is received only when it possesses the whole soul and finds its seat and habitation in the inmost recesses of the heart. Calvinists specifically are kind of known for being very doctrinally solid and maybe very cold. Um, very often accused of not practicing what they preach. They're very solid on doctrine, but very slim on Christian charity. Calvin would have none of that. Right? True doctrine is not just mere intellectual assent. True doctrine, these truths that we learn, they just don't go in your memory bank. They, they seep into your heart. They seep into your character. Right? Knowing that God is sovereign, great. This, God just doesn't want you to know that to know that. Right? Knowing God is sovereign, right? It, goes down and it influences in the way you behave, in the way you act, in the way you suffer, in the way you grieve. Right? It becomes a part of you. And unfortunately, for many people in all churches, many Baptist churches, many people I know, doctrine is a bad word. Right? Doctrine divides. And it does divide. It divides the sheep from the goats. Because doctrine seeps into life. Right? And your life, your life really tells what your doctrine is. So by 1550, Europe is split, and we have more than just Catholicism, more than just Lutheranism. So in green, you can see these are the Catholic countries still. Spain, Portugal, stand and solid. No one's going to knock them down. Italy, of course, uh, very papist. And France, right? In these purple areas, in the purple stripes, right, those are Calvinist or Reformed areas. Right? So you'll see this is Switzerland, southern France, uh, Scotland. In the light pink, you see Lutheranism, which is very big in northern Germany and Scandinavia. You can see that Lutheranism, or sorry, Lutheranism and Calvinism actually extend the parts all the way up to Russia, which is pretty influential. Now, unfortunately, during the religious wars of the next century, that's going to be almost completely wiped away, and Catholicism is going to be reinstituted in those areas. But areas of Poland and Eastern Europe actually uh, embraced the Reformed faith rather early. You would never know that today, though, uh, thanks to a century of war right after this. And Calvin was really influential on the Reformation in France. Uh, during Calvin's lifetime, King Henry II of France brutally tortured the French Protestants, known as Huguenots. Uh, in 1559, Calvin drafted a confession of faith for the French church that is still used today. <coughs> Uh, his hymns were very influential in spreading Protestantism in France. Uh, Luther's hymns were actually really important in spreading Lutheranism in Germany. One of the reasons I, I really loathe so much of modern-day contemporary Christian music is because it teaches nothing. It teaches absolutely nothing. It's, it's basically the same kind of rock music from the secular channel, and instead of saying, she loves me, they throw Jesus loves me in, and they sing it 18,000 times. 
Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. They'll throw in three words, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. It teaches no content. One of the things I, one of the things that I was playing Luther's hymns for, right? Luther never repeats in his hymns. So when you get to Dear Christians, One and All Rejoice, it's, I don't remember, six, seven, eight stanzas, all different, because it's telling a story. It's telling a story of redemption. And that's what a good hymn does, regardless of whether it's written in the 16th century or it's written by, say, the Gettys today. Hymnody tells, tells the story of the Bible. It shares the doctrine. It tries to infuse it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that and that reformers understood that, and they used that to great effect, uh, Luther and Calvin. By the way, Luther was pretty favorable to Calvin in the beginning. This is just kind of interesting. Uh, you know, because Calvin's kind of a young upstart. Luther, you know, is towards the end of his life. You know, he's within 10 years of dying by the time the Institutes is produced. And at first he actually, so he like he reads uh, Calvin's reply to Satteletto, and he's actually pretty impressed. Uh, and then later he just thinks Calvin is, you know, just a heretical beast like the rest of the Zwinglians uh, because of his doctrine of the Lord's Supper. Uh, Calvin, on the other hand, always revered Luther. There's a great line in Needham's book, uh, where Calvin is writing to Bullinger, and he said, even though Luther would call, he said, I would reverence Luther even if he were to call me a devil. Uh, which is kind of kind of the thing today, right? So many of us Protestants, myself especially, I'm just enamored with Martin Luther. Love the guy. Uh, but he would, he would think that I was an arch heretic, right, if I was watching, walking around Wittenberg because of my view of the Lord's Supper. So it's one of those things that Luther had the power that even people like Calvin, who were intellectually his equal, if not superior, reverence the guy, even though he would call them a heretic. So it's pretty great. Uh, we, are, we are not so tough today. We are not so tough. First Edict of Toleration, 1562. It allowed for certain freedoms from the Huguenots. So they were allowed to do public worship in certain areas. Didn't last very long, though, because 10 years later, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, 1572, 24th of August, uh, the Catholics arose in mass and killed 20,000 Protestants throughout France. They killed 6,000-ish in Paris alone, in including time. most of the noble leaders of Protestantism. So there were several noble families that were, were, were <clears throat> proponents of Protestantism. One of, the, one of the really famous guys was an admiral named Admiral Collini. Uh, they murdered him and threw him out a window uh, in Paris. This was at the time when... I want to say the king of France's daughter was getting married. Um, yeah, so sweet way. Was this all in one day? It was, yeah, all in one day, 1572. Yeah, so not a great deal. Not a great deal. Um, in the 1590s, Henry IV becomes king. Henry IV was actually not originally in line to become king until later. He was actually a Protestant. And then when it came, came out that he was going to be the heir, he was the next in line to the throne, they said, hey, if you want to be king, you have to be Catholic. And he famously said, Paris is worth a mass. And so he converts to Catholicism. However, he still has very Protestant reading tendencies. And so he issues what's called the Edict of Nantes. I can't pronounce French. I have no idea if that's how you say it. In 1598, he gives the Huguenots a lot of freedom for about 90 years, 85-ish years, until King Louis XIV, the famous Sun King comes along and he gets rid of the Edict of Nantes. Uh, France had a lot of Protestants at one time. They do not have a lot of Protestants now. Uh, and again, that's going to be in the, the next century that we see a lot of that happen. All right, and finally, what was the Radical Reformation? The Anabaptists. The Anabaptists. Excellent. You read the notes that are in your hands. Oh, no. I didn't do my little, my little trickery. Uh, the rise of the Anabaptists. So, a lot, basically everyone that disagreed with Luther and Calvin back in the Cal and the Catholics back in the day got accused of being Anabaptists. They're not all Anabaptists. Uh, today we're going to specifically talk about the Anabaptists proper, which really come out of Zwingli Zurich, known as the Swiss Brethren of the 1520s. Uh, they were led by very educated men, Conrad Grebel, Felix Mons, George Blaurock, Balthazar Hubmeier, and some other cool-sounding German-Swiss names. And the Anabaptists opposed, eventually, the practice of infant baptism. They were called Anabaptists. Zwingli actually gave them that name. Anna just means bef uh, to re, like to rebaptize. Rebaptizers, that's what they were called. Because, you got to remember, all of them were baptized as kids, because everyone was baptized as a kid back in the day. 
1525 in Zurich, Conrad Gremmel baptized Blaurock. Uh, he did not do it by immersion. Uh, he did it by infusion, so he poured water out. Uh, he baptized Blaurock, and then Blaurock baptized another 15 nudes. Uh, this is a huge, this is not just something that you disagree about. To reject infant baptism is to reject what makes you a citizen of the state. Right? When you're baptized, it's not just a church thing, it's a civic thing. Uh, and the Anabaptists didn't really believe in any confluence of the church and state. These two things are radically separate. In fact, if you're going to be a true member of the church, you shouldn't participate in the state at all is what they're going to come to. So nobody liked these guys because the Lutherans still believed, they believed the state and the church. The Reformed had some variation of, well, no, the church should control itself, but we should have Christian commonwealth. And then you get the Anabaptists that say, okay, let the state do whatever it wants. We're going to have the church. Not a popular position. Uh, it didn't help that many of the early ones, not necessarily these guys, but some of the early ones were pretty militant. Uh, they were not afraid to fight. Uh, until they had a series of really unfortunate losses, and they all kind of got together in 1527 and created the Schleitheim Confession, which you actually have, which are kind of the seven principal tenets of the Anabaptists. Uh, one thing I want to note is, a lot of people, there's even one of my alma maters is really big on this, right? Is trying to prove that modern day Baptists, us, come from the Anabaptists. We do not. We do not descend from the Anabaptists. Now, we have some things in common, like we don't believe in infant baptism, right? We believe that the church is separate from the state, right? So there's commonalities in some of our beliefs. We, we disagree on other beliefs, right? We, have, we don't have a problem with military service, most of us, clearly. Um, <laughs> we don't have a problem with with taking oaths and legal ceremonies, right? So, so there's not this direct kinship, but we do share some things in common. And because modern day Baptists descend really from the Calvinist movement, a lot of Baptists, and there are most of them, a good portion of them that are not Calvinists, don't like that. They keep trying to find a connection with the Anabaptists, okay? Uh, and I've even some, seen some pretty good historians that aren't really Baptist historians basically say, oh, and the Baptists came from the Anabaptists. Not the case. We're going to see it. Later on, but the Baptists, we actually come out of the English Congregationalists, which come out of the Presbyterians, which come from the Calvinist wing of the Reformation. Uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, when it's founded in 1845, all the members that signed it come from Calvinist preaching churches, uh, which is interesting to know. Uh, their Anabaptist actual descendants still exist today as the Mennonites and the Amish. Right? So if you've ever been to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, you have almost undoubtedly met an Anabaptist. Right, the Amish or the Mennonites. Are the Quakers considered no. in that group? No. no, no, the Quakers are a different breed. Okay. George Fox starts the Quakers. Uh, and they, and what's really interesting about the Quakers is they actually start very militantly as well, uh, which is now they're known for being super pacifists, but in the beginning they were not. Uh, opposition to the Anabaptists. Like I said, everyone hated these guys, thought they were to destabilize the state. Uh, Felix Mance became the first of these guys to be executed for his faith by fellow Protestants. Uh, and well, they wouldn't consider the, the, the Zwinglians or the, the Reformed and the Lutherans, they actually wouldn't consider the Anabaptists Protestant. They're not the ones protesting the Catholic Church. They're doing their own thing. Uh, and as a result, some of these people that try and attach Baptists to the Anabaptists say, well, Baptists really aren't Protestant. That's the most foolish thing I've ever heard. We're absolutely Protestant. Uh, Michael Sadler, who's actually one of the principal guys that drafted the Schleitheim Confession you have, he was terribly tortured by the Catholics of Germany in 1527. Uh, they took red-hot pinchers and tore flesh from his body several times uh, before they finally executed him. They also ripped out his tongue while he was alive. Uh, Hubmeyer and Blaurock also burned at the stake by Catholics uh, within two years of Sadler. So... Felix Mance, you gotta give it, you gotta give it to Zurich. Uh, they executed him by drowning, which is a very ironic way for an Anabaptist to die. Uh, in fact, Michael Sattler, after he was terribly tortured, I think three days later, the Catholics took his wife out and drowned her in the drink. Okay, so what are our key points? One, reform is a group project. It's not just one guy. Luther gets all, basically all the credit for the most part of the Reformation. He, 
he deserves a lot of credit. He's not the only guy. And in the Reform Movement, Calvin is not the only guy. Calvin, at, at, in his lifetime, is probably not even the most important guy. You have a lot of guys. Zwingli, Bullinger, Bootser, Vermeule, and Calvin are all vitally important to what we would now call the Reform faith. Second, Reform is a lifelong mission. Right? Calvin never wanted to go to Geneva, and he certainly did not want to go back. He actually wrote that he would rather die... Did I put the quote there? Yeah, he said, I would rather submit to a hundred other deaths than to that cross on which I would have to perish a thousand times every day. He did not want to go back to Geneva, but he felt that God had called him back, and he was a very conscientious fellow, and so he went. But Calvin never got everything he wanted. Right? Calvin wanted to celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper, every week. Town council said, no, you can only do it four times a week. But Calvin, you got to remember at the same time, all these guys had sicknesses throughout their lives, especially Calvin. Calvin was kind of a sickly dude. Uh, and there's no medicine for that. So at the same time that they're preaching several times a week, that they're writing these books, that they're founding churches, they're also suffering with kidney stones, with headaches that just won't go away, with all these kind of ailments that, again, uh, we take for granted because you take 800 milligrams of vitamin M and you feel right as rain. And we also have to remember that reform is often messy and controversial. Right? So the Reformation starts great in, in Zurich to, for a large part, fall out with Luther of the Lord's Supper. Then you have the Anabaptists challenging you, basically destabilizing the state with their views. One of the things we need to get through our minds is when the Reformation happens, this is not just a bunch of people reading the Bible together and locking arms and walking down the road together. Okay? There's a lot of, hey, we're reading the Bible and we disagree with how you read the Bible. Uh, and we would be foolish if we passed over that there's some very tragic, very tragic stories uh, in the Reformation that are not perpetrated by Catholics, that are perpetrated by fellow Protestants on each other. Uh, again, regardless of how you feel about Felix Mance's belief, drowning him in the Lamat uh, for his belief in adult baptism, believer's baptism is, I guess we would say pretty not cool, pretty uncouth. Um, and it's important to remember that we, we often say, right, because we see today in Facebook and a bunch of other things, we, all, we often talk about how contentious things are to, today. We wish we could get back to this time where you could disagree in a great manner. I want you to see when you read the Reformation, that's not how it worked. Um, in fact, back in the day, saying the wrong thing could get you killed. Um, if you were lucky, you just got a scolding by Luther in print that people were reading 500 years later. Poor Erasmus. Um, but he was wrong. All right. Questions, comments, concerns. That is so much history to go over in one hour. Are yes. We, so where do the Anabaptists go? They get kind of get kicked out of Zurich, so do they just... Yeah, so the Mennonites and the Amish uh, kind of in parts of Germany, right? So which is why even, even in Amish country today, uh, they speak high German in their church services. Uh, they very often, you see the movies and stuff, but they do actually call other people that live in the area that aren't secular, they call them the English. Uh, so they're still, I mean, even to this day, 500 years later, with, with the Amish, you still see a very Germanic uh, culture they, amongst them. They won't even print their Bibles in English. It has to be in German. Yeah, yeah, no, they, and they will not do a church service. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's in high church, too, so it's legit. Um, I'm not a fan of the Amish. I'll say that. Just because I don't believe in the, in the belief that you're going to convert the world by sitting around and showing them your example. I do not believe that's what Christ means in the Great Commission. Right? So I actually think that the Anabaptists, for the most part, especially the Amish, are basically at odds with Christ's teaching on sharing the Word of God. They are very insular people. And I understand right, that they want to keep themselves holy and have a godly community. At the same time, God calls us to live in the world, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in the world. Uh, and even to this day, Right, the descendants of the Anabaptists, again, specifically the Amish, they don't do that. They're probably not going to get offended because they're probably not going to watch this. But. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So, are we going to talk about Eastern Orthodoxy and where that came from? And well, we talked about that a long time ago. But, like, well, like, how strong it is now, like, when you did the little math. 
Yeah, so so Eastern Orthodoxy, here's, so no, we're not gonna, I don't have any time to talk about Eastern Orthodoxy. That being said, here's what you need to know. Since the Second Council of Nicaea, it basically hasn't changed at all. Uh, the way Eastern Orthodox worship today is almost identical to how they worship 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Uh, they are very consistent in their practices. So, and they are still very dominant in the areas they've been before. Greece, uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, Eastern Europe. So Eastern Orthodox still strong there as far as, you know, how religious are the people. You can say that about any area. But as far as doctrinally, doctrinal development is not a thing the Eastern Orthodox prize. It's not, it's not a good thing. Uh, that's actually one of their problems with the West. They've they never had, like, a major reform. There's been no reformation, though. Hmm. Great question. Anything else? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for allowing us to learn about the Reformed faith and the proponents of it. Lord God, we thank you for their example, both good and bad, that we might learn from it, Lord God. I pray that we would love the scriptures as much as they did, that we would delve deep into the word of God, that it would refresh our souls, that it would drip from our lips a sweet honey, Lord God, that we would defend that faith once and for all, delivered to the saints, that we would serve God in our generation. And Lord God, I pray that as we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, we would remember not only that Lord and Savior that died for us, that was broken for us, that bled for us, but that this very ordinance that we do at the Lord's Supper is something felt and believed so strongly by fellow Protestants that it splits churches, Lord God. Lord, let us, regardless of our belief in the Lord's Supper, let us not trivialize it. Let us not think little of it. Let us not pay it any attention, for it is the thing that has divided your people most in history since the Reformation. All these things we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.